Um, awesome. And it looks like we've got all of our members that we will need to hear now. So, uh, Dennis, if you would like to call to order, um, I can launch into roll call and we can get started. Yep. Thank you. This is Landfather. We're going to call the meeting to order. It is 3.04 p.m. Eastern and uh, Zubak's going to take roll. Thank you, Landfather. Uh, Daniel Alexander. Present. Thank you. Ashley, and I hope I don't butcher your last name, Ajinkia. Close enough. Present. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, John Barber. Present. Thank you. Logan Black. Hillary Brooks. Present. Thank you. Nancy Carter. George Childress. Hank Jenkins. Present. Thank you. Dennis Landfather. Present. Thank you. Karen Lowe. Aquila Maxwell. Uh, Christopher, Christopher Maddie Matheson has reported he will be absent today, as has Kanya Mall and Monica Shimon Orr. Paul Robertson. Present. Thank you. Joel Simmons. Joel, I see you. Are you there? Stacy Spangler. I'm here. Thank you. Jessica Villanueva. Here. And Nancy Welch. Here. Thank you all. Thank you, Misha. Yes. Are you are you good? We're good. We have um, we've got quorum. Okay. So we need to approve May's minutes. Does anybody want to make a motion? This is Barbara. I'll make that motion that we approve May's minutes. Second that, emo second that motion. Anyone? This is Spangler. I'll second. Barbara and Spangler, motion and second. Thank uh, you. Anybody opposed to that? No? All right. Motion carried. Looks like we're going to be moving right into our presentation. Today we have Adam Curitan. Did I, did I say that right, Adam? All right, great, good. Uh, he's philosophy of disability professor at UTK. I have to say, I didn't even know that was a thing, philosophy of disability. So that's really cool. I already learned something. Uh, Misha, do you have anything you want to say before he takes over? Um, I will pass that along to Ms. Cook, who has known uh, Mr. Curitan for a while now, I believe. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Mr. Curitan invited me to come and speak to one of his classes. I don't remember how long ago that was, but it was a very long time ago. And I too, I was floored that this class even existed. And then um, I attended and I see and I hear some of the things that Adam is imparting to the students. And I, I kind of like, I think I should go back to school, you know? If it wasn't for the whole tuition and time issue, I would have done that. Um, but I'm not going to steal any of his thunder. Adam and I sit on the Commission for Disability together at UT. Uh, and so I've had the, the pleasure of seeing and working with him on a monthly basis for a couple of years now. And um, so when an opportunity came to have an agenda where he could come and speak to us about the class and what he does, I thought it would be amazing to offer that opportunity. We reached out and he about came back immediately with yes, when and where. So we appreciate that, uh, Adam. And, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Great, thank thank you so much, uh, uh, Stephanie and Misha, for inviting me uh, to this to this really great group. Um, so it's really wonderful to be here. Uh, so I, I should say, you know, that that Stephanie, as you all well know, is amazing. Uh, she is almost single handedly like, you know, helping to knock UT into shape uh, with regard to disability issues. 
Um, and uh, we are incredibly grateful for her time um, helping the university, which which needs needs a lot of help. Um, so what I thought I'd do is uh, is you know in this little talk, uh, first tell you a bit about myself, uh, then talk to you about some things that I've been doing at UT um, uh, with regard to uh, disability and especially philosophy of disability. Say a little about what that is. And then talk about what impact I think this is having uh, at UT and the the broader the broader community. So uh, just about I'll start with with myself. So uh, I um, have been legally blind since since birth. Had known uh, no no different than that. Um, but you know, I, so my my father was in the military, uh, and so we moved around um, a lot. And I, you know, sort of every time we moved, I was sort of faced with a new decision about whether to sort of hide or downplay my disability or to be open. And for the most part, I really tried my best to try to try to hide the fact that I that I can't see uh, very well. Now, it's sort of strange how actually easy that is, at least with someone with an invisible disability, because I think people just don't want to think of others as having <laughs> having a disability. So, you know, someone would say, oh, you know, oh, my gosh, look at that over there. And I think, OK, I've got two choices. Either I should be aghast or I should laugh. And then I just have to flip a coin and just pick one. And sometimes I'd get it right. And sometimes sometimes not. In fact, it was so bad that my my father Sign me up to play Little League Baseball. Now, I mean, how ridiculous. I can't see the ball. Uh, and I remember sitting in the outfield just thinking, oh, please, please, God, do not have this ball come to me. And one time it did. I just heard it. And I heard it hit the ground. And I was like scrambling around on my hands and knees <laughs> grabbing this thing. And I ended up throwing it the wrong direction. Uh, so, you know, I, but, you know, part of, part of my childhood was a kind of, you know, dual education. Education in you know, kind of, you know, in what the world should be like for people with disabilities, and also education in what the world is actually like and how to get by uh, in a in a sort of ableist world that we live in. But I finally came out, so to speak, in in college, uh, and got very interested in um, in issues of disability. But you know, I, I decided as my career path to to be a philosopher, which of course just my parents were were aghast at, uh, because, and I, you know, not for any sort of noble reason, but, but honestly, I, I remember thinking that, you know, this is one of the few professions that staring blankly into space uh, counts as a sign of genius. Like, you know, and so I'm like, hey, that's what I do. And so maybe this will like, I won't, you know, um, uh, you know, it'll actually be a, a virtue uh, of being a philosopher. So I um, uh, went to uh, Oxford University on a Rhodes Scholarship um, and studied uh, philosophy and disability uh, and came back and did my PhD at, at UNC Chapel Hill before coming here uh, to UT in, in 2011. And one of my main interests as I've sort of come to UT and, and tried, to, tried to engender in, in the university is in this sort of new uh, and growing field of philosophy of disability. So I thought I'd, I'd tell you a bit about what, what that is and why, why it's important. So, you know, it wasn't until maybe the late 70s or the early 80s that uh, there was sort of increasing interest among, um, you know, started with sociologists and psychologists, um, but then also a few philosophers, in, in disability um, as its own area of research. And so the thought was that fundamental issues about the significance of variations in physical and mental functioning um, are relevant to a wide range of topics, including human performance and well-being, you know, what it is to live a good, a good happy life, for ideas of personal and social identity, you know, people identifying as disabled or with various disability rights movements. Um, for intimate relationships, how, how to, you know, uh, um, sort of properly relate to, respect, um, and not offend um, a family member or friend or child who, who has a disability. For self-respect, 
you know, maintaining a sense of one's own worth um, in a society that devalues people like you. And in justice, uh, you know, how are we going to distribute resources? How are we going to design our physical and social environments? How do these claims, you know, match up against competing claims for resources that I'm sure you all, you know, more than most are, are quite aware of? So I, I'm going to say a bit more about some of these some of these topics, but I'll just say why you know why the heck one would be interested in them, and why this field of philosophy of disability might be um, you know something that that our society needs to support. So for one thing, I, I really do think there's just academic interest. For too long, people with disabilities were at the margins of critical thought and reflection about the human condition about our world, about who we are, and about where we're going. Uh, they were you know, locked away in um, institutions, hidden from others, or and regarded as something to be feared uh, and um, uh, you know, put off by, rather than in its own right, something that is a part of what it is to be human. As, as we often say, if we're lucky enough, all of us will be disabled. That is, if we're lucky to live long enough, we will have a disability of some kind. So this is part of what it is to be human. And so academics, people who are thinking about these basic questions of humanity, just whether or not it has any, any you know, purchase anywhere else, just need to be incorporating disability as an essential feature of the human condition. Um, now, I understand, though, that, you know, academic interest can only take you so far. I'm a firm believer in the power of ideas. Uh, so it's not just that people, that some of the great ideas in human history have just been, you know, put in textbooks and, you know, um, uh, admired from a distance, but they have led to real social change. You know, times in which we, we, we thought about notions of race and gender, uh, you know, very quickly translated into the suffrage movement and the civil rights movement. And I think thinking about disability in the 1970s among disability scholars um, led directly to um, all of the great advances, uh, 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 you know, sort of incomplete as they are um, in, you know, for, for the rights of, of disabled people. So part of, part of the thought of, of trying to get clear on some of these ideas uh, about disability is that they might be able to someday trickle down uh, and uh, and influence politicians and uh, and policymakers and and others. Thirdly, as we all are well aware, there is sort of you know growing and growing technological innovation that raises deep uh, and important and new questions uh, that people with disabilities need to be on the forefront helping to answer. So things like um, artificial intelligence, you know, it's being used now for people with various kinds of disabilities um, uh, to supplement attendance, you know, caregivers. Um, it, neurological implants uh, are being used to restore some functioning to limbs. Um, thinking about the ethics of all of this, what assumptions are, are being, you know, underlined? Or even just more practically, are disabled people involved in the development and testing of these uh, of these technologies? These are all things that that we need to be as a society thinking about, and not just leave it to the the Silicon Valley uh, gurus. And finally, I think philosophy of disability and work that's produced in this field can have a very personal impact for many of us. In fact, it has for me. Reading about these ideas of impairment and disability and well-being and justice can help to give people a, a set of concepts to understand their own experiences. So think by analogy of you know, time before we really had a, a sort of widespread concept of sexual harassment. Many women experienced what we now call sexual harassment, but maybe didn't have a word for it or couldn't quite explain what it, it was that was uh, offending them by the treatment that they were receiving. And then philosophers and others, you know, came around and started thinking about the, the gender issues and mistreatment of women as a way of helping to make women to make sense of their own experiences. 
I think something that is very similar um, is happening for people with disabilities so that we can sort of, you know, kind of get what it is to be us <laughs> uh, through some tools that um, uh, that that academic uh, research can give. So let me uh, let me say something briefly about some of the topics in philosophy of disability that I find most interesting before I'll, I end by talking about some classes that I've taught in these in these areas. So look, one big thing is the social model of disability, which I'm sure you all are all um, uh, intimately aware of. The idea that what disadvantages disabled people is not our impairments, not our uh, deviation from sort of, you know, proper, normal, or typical functioning, you know, not being able to see at a certain distance or, um, uh, or hear certain sounds or whatever, but rather the, uh, the, 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 the oppression and discrimination and inaccessible environments that people with, with certain kinds of bodies and minds uh, tend to be subjected to. So the disadvantage is mainly the result of society uh, rather than a problem with the condition itself. So this is, as you know, a was a revolutionary idea. It turned sort of thought of thoughts about disability entirely on its head. But uh, despite the the social power that the social model of disability has had, we want to make sure that it is sort of airtight that it is stated and argued for as clearly and precisely as we can. We, we don't want to rest with vagueness, with indeterminacy, with, with problems uh, with, with the model, uh, but you know, want to give it its sort of firmest uh, basis that we, that we can because of the use that we want to put it to in various fields of, of life. So this is one of the tasks of philosophy of disability, is to prod and poke the social model to see what problems we can come up with and how we can solve them. So one of the big ones that's, you know, that people are currently arguing about is whether the social model really captures a significant part of what it is to be disabled, at least for some people. Namely, the ways in which certain impairments just come with pain. Pain hurts. And what philosophers are sort of struggling with is, can we explain the badness of pain, the disadvantage that comes from chronic pain um, as a kind of disability, simply as a matter of something society has done? In other words, could we change society in a way that we could eliminate the pain that is associated with certain disabilities? So that's a, I mean, it's not a big problem because it's still, it's only one kind of disability, but again, we want to make the social model as, as airtight as we, as we can. Another big issue is the relationship between disability and what it is to live a, a good and happy life. So despite the progress that's been made in many facets of life, including medicine, the underlying assumption is that having a disability makes someone's life inherently worse for them. That it's a, it's a burden, it's a tragedy, it's something to be avoided because, for the person herself. Now, you can see how this would then very much lead to various things like researching cures for disabilities rather than spending that money on making environments accessible. Or it would favor prenatal testing for disability. And it would favor um, uh, physician-assisted suicide on the, uh, on, on the basis of disability. But philosophers are pushing back on this idea, this idea that having a disability necessarily makes your life go worse. What they argue instead is, no, your disability is simply a different kind of body and mind. It's something, it's like hair color or skin color. It's not inherently bad for you. What's bad for many of us with disabilities is the ways that society treats us. So we shouldn't then be so concerned about curing disability or prenatal testing and the like. Instead, we should be focusing our attention on making society as accessible as we can. 
there's been discussions of disability in connection with health. Uh, you know, is it possible for a disabled person to be healthy? Well, of course it is, right? I mean, yeah, you know, I, I'm, a dis I'm disabled and I I'm, I'm consider myself perfectly healthy. But of course, this is not how doctors tend to think of disability. They tend to think that, look, their job is to promote health. And if you have a disability, that means that you are unhealthy. And so there's something about you that we need to fix. So philosophers try to sort through these different ideas of what is health and what is disability and how do they relate to each other. And then finally, the, the last point I'll mention is, is one that's sort of especially interesting to me. How do we have and show respect to people with disabilities in our everyday lives? So I'll just tell you, I, I've been at conferences, for example, where people have known that I can't see. And, you know, well-meaning people will come up to me and sort of grab me by the arm and start leading me to the next, the next talk. Now, look, on the one hand, they're being nice, right? They're not trying to belittle me. It's not a matter of condescension. On the other hand, it really just rubs me the wrong way. I think that sort of, you know, the, that, that respect for other people, giving them their space, is something that's very often ignored uh, when it comes to the ways that we treat disabled people in our everyday lives. You don't have to always rush ahead to open a door for a, a wheelchair user. She's perfectly, perfectly, uh, you know, able to open that door herself and might wonder, you know, sort of what are you trying to say by making such a big deal about um, trying to open this door, this door for me. So these sort of subtle kind of, you know, they're not life or death things, but as other, you know, sort of, um, you know, minority groups have increasingly called our attention to, these kind of small, subtle slights uh, can accumulate and be, themselves sort of undermine a person's own sense of, of self-worth. Um, and so it's worth thinking about these kinds of attitudes. So finally, I'll uh, just you know briefly say, so at, at UT, I um, uh, several times taught a course, a special topics course in philosophy of disability, where we basically took up all of these issues that I've been discussing and, and others. Um, and in fact, I just recently got this added to the permanent course catalog. So now it, it's a permanent course in philosophy of disability that, that students will be able to, to take. It, it was sort of shocking to me how much the students loved the course. And there were really two kinds. So one kind were people who just you know reacted by, I had no idea about any of these issues. I didn't know that they were they were even that even existed. I learned about the the suffrage movement and the civil rights movement, but I never learned about the disability rights movement. And I never learned about the kinds of experiences that disabled people have and the kinds of ways in which society is often mistreating them. So these sort of, you know, typical students at UT, you know, it's clear that they're going to take some of these lessons with them. Uh, in whatever walks of life they they end up um, going into. But finally, what was especially heart what's especially heartening to me is that in these classes that I've taught, more than half of the students were students who identified as disabled themselves. And that it wasn't like I you know went out set out to do that, but they especially told me that they found a home, that this was the first class they'd ever taken where their experiences, their points of view were taken seriously and incorporated into the kinds of issues that, that the, course, uh, the course discussed. So that I think is, is a kind of service to, you know, both the disabled students themselves and to the wider, to, you know, to our, to our community more generally, um, giving people uh, the sort of respect of taking their own points of view uh, uh, seriously. So that's that's all I have uh, to say. Uh, but I'm more than happy to answer any any questions or or anything I can I can do. Go ahead, uh, Stephanie. Does UT have a a degree program in disability of some sort? I mean, I, I know if you're teaching this class and there are others, I was just curious if there was like a 
training track or degree in disability? There should be. Uh, and, you know, it's one of the things that I've sort of had in the back of my mind. The There is the, you know, what's called the special education uh, program as part of the, the College of Education, but that's, that's very much focused on practical uh, practical issues. There are, you know, maybe a few people at UT whose research is on issues of disability, um, but I, I suspect that over time, more and more will will just, as it happens, uh, be hired with those kinds of interests. And I'm definitely sort of keeping my ear to the ground to try to come up with some kind of, you know, certificate or concentration or something like like other universities have. So far, Stephanie, it, it's basically me. You know, so, you know, I'll, I'll give you a certificate if you want. Uh, I can print it off. Uh, but, you know, we, we, need, we need more people. I appreciate the answer. In your <laughs> candor. <laughs> hey, Adam, this is Landfather. I'd just like to say I really appreciate your uh, excitement and fervor <laughs> towards this subject. I mean, it really it really shines through. I can imagine being in your class would be very delightful. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> and, no problem. Looks like Simmons has his hand up. Go ahead, Joel. Yeah, Adam. Thanks for your time. Very. I'm. I'm with Dennis. You're. You're. But I, I'm. Uh, uh, I have. I have quadriplegia, and my left arm doesn't work quite as good as my right arm. Thirteen and a half years uh, in in the chair, and I have heard the 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 uh, the comments on somebody opening the door uh, for numerous times and um, of course I can get in and out of places when there's not I'm kind of uh, upset by people being upset with a with a with a common courtesy uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't I don't find sometimes especially if it's raining or something I don't uh I, I don't know I'm I, I just I can't wrap my head around that 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 somebody is is that stubborn, but it's nothing against you. Like I said, I have heard this from the from from wheelchair users and all alike. And uh, personally, I like living in a society where where courtesy is is there, and and I don't take it as a slight. I, I can get in. I worked hard to to try to get in most stuff, but that that's that's all I had on that. But yeah, I'm I'm with Dennis. I'd love to be in one of your classes. You have a great passion for it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Joel. And of course, I, I, I agree with you. Part of it is just how, how complicated these, these things are and how much they depend on different people and different circumstances and, and so on. But I'll, I, I'll, uh, I'll just say, you know, what, part of, I guess, what I, what I really think is that there's just this tendency to somehow want to help disabled people more than others, sort of beyond common courtesy. Whereas at least many people with disabilities just want to be treated by the same common courtesy that you would give everyone else. So look, my wife is one of these people. She opens doors for everybody. I mean, just like, I don't care if you're going that way or not. She's going to run and she's going to open the door. Then like, yeah, I would, you know, wouldn't be offended at all if, if she did that. But, you know, there are these some people that somehow it's somehow about the, the, the you know, having a disability itself that leads them to do it. Whereas maybe a, a, a third third strategy is kind of wait and you know hang back and see whether the person would appreciate it. So I know wheelchair users who are like, look, it took me so long to figure out how to open doors. I I can do it myself. I don't I don't need you. Other people very much you know like, hey, great, open the door. So kind of get a sense of what the person wants rather than just immediately assuming that just because they're in a wheelchair, you know, of course they want you to open the door for them. But I agree with you, Joel, man. I, you know, I, I'm just, I'm trying to think through these complicated things myself. Uh, thanks. Uh, Jenkins, looks like you got a question. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, first of all, I just want to say I really appreciate this uh, presentation. Really, uh, really good stuff. And, uh, you know, just to go along with that, that conversation, as you said, a lot of times it's reading the situation. Uh, sometimes my biggest frustration, I'm a, I'm a wheelchair user, paraplegic. Um, my biggest frustration, like something I do every day, get in and out of my car, get in my wheelchair, the amount of people that want to stop and grab my wheelchair and try to yes. help me and I say, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I do this all the time. Let me, let me be, you know, and, and for them, as you said, it's, it's trying to be a common courtesy, but they don't realize like how much time they're actually adding to the process by them 
coming over and messing everything up. Um, but my, my question really was like, is there a push for some of your philosophy stuff for uh, medical professions or anybody who, who will be dealing with people with disabilities? I, I'm kind of shocked at the amount of times that, you know, I go to a doctor or I go to people who, who are able-bodied but work with people with disabilities and just have no idea about disability culture whatsoever or about disability yes. etiquette whatsoever. So I, yeah, I'm just curious if there's a, a push for that. Absolutely, there's a push. I mean, it needs needs a bit, you know needs more oomph and resources behind it. But yes, there are what are what are called medical humanities um, courses that are being uh, starting to be included in medical school curricula, where the thought is like, and they're focused on disability. Like, look, if there's any group in this society that we think should like have awareness of and you know a deep you know understanding of disability, it's it's medical professionals, but it's not the case. So these things are trying to rectify that because, but of course you see the pushback, right? So much of it is entrenched in the medical profession itself. We're like broken. And so something needs to be fixed about us. And if you come into it like that, then you think, well, why do we need to all this you know, touchy feely stuff? But if you just turn that whole thing on its head, then it makes it much more plausible that we need to have much more training for, uh, for medical professionals. In fact, a, a, um, I, I just read a study, it's really kind of uh, disheartening, that not only is there sort of, you know, the sort of lack of, of understanding of disability, doctors who were sort of anonymously interviewed, so their names wouldn't appear, many of them just like admitted to not taking on patients who had disabilities, because they had disabilities. They just thought that's just too much hassle. And so they would, now they wouldn't say that, they would find other ways to, oh, maybe it'd be better to see somebody else. But if, if even that kind of blatant discrimination is going on, man, we've got big problems. Zubak. Hi, this is Zubak. I'm gonna piggyback on that just a little bit. Um, I often get every year the brochure of non-credit courses for UT. Have you ever thought about doing this as a non-credit course so it would be more available to the general public to be able to take that? What a great idea. In fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna really show how uh, how much of an absent-minded professor I am. I didn't even know that such courses existed. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some research and because uh, I think that would be a a great thing to do and it would be a blast, you know, to get members of the wider community, um, especially. Uh, people with disabilities uh, talking about this stuff. I, I Thank you for, for telling me about that. Very welcome. And uh, from what I remember, they've got um, the regular non-credit adult courses, but I believe they also have some geared towards the younger generations that aren't even college age yet. Um, right. And I also had one more thing to add. Um, Cody is always here. We meet every month. So in... Uh, while you're doing your courses, now that this is going to be uh, an every semester thing or every year thing, if you would like to send your students to us of their own accord cool. or assignment, um, we would be more than happy to have them join us for these. Oh, well, that's very kind of you to offer. And I think I'm, I'm going to really think about that. I think that would be really, really cool, uh, you know, because you know, okay, they get access to me. I'm up there, you know, you know, shooting the shit. But, uh, you know, other it'd be good to have other perspectives on some of the stuff. Uh, you know, Joel, for example, can tell them that I, I'm I'm off base on on some things. Uh, so yeah, that'd be good for them to hear that. This is Simmons again. No, no, no. I don't think you're off base. <laughs> I think I think that's it, it's it, it it's a it's a personal. I've been in a support groups and uh, i think is might be some of that what's going on between the person with the disability what's going on between their ears uh I, there's, there's a there's a lot a lot of things there. i just always just like to say i appreciate living in a kind and courteous world this is jenkins but but simmons will will never be afraid to tell you when he thinks you're off base though <laughs> Anybody, anybody else have uh, any questions? Oh, uh, go for it. Anyone here in the Zoom room interested in now going back to school? 
<laughs> yeah, hey, this hey. is this is Landfather, and I would actually love to sit in on your class sometime. Not for credits, just to sit in on here as a disabled veteran uh, with non-visible disabilities. Um, also, be very happy to get up there and speak as well if you ever need a guest lecturer. So, just throwing very, that out there. Very cool. That, um, uh, and then you can feel some of the pain I do, which is, uh, you know, with these students. You know, I'm all excited, and I and they're just like, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, may, maybe you can you can you know jolt them uh, a bit. <laughs> if you had anything else, anybody else have anything? For Ms. Curitan? I don't see any more hands up. Well, Adam, thank you so much for your time. What a what a great uh, presentation and great to learn. So thank you very, very much. Uh, Misha, you have anything? No, I do not have anything. Uh, but Adam, again, like he said, thank you so much for coming and joining us. And you've got my email now and I've got yours. So hopefully we'll be in touch soon. Great. Thank, thank you all. It's great to meet everybody and, and, and good luck with the rest of your meeting. Thank you. This is Simmons again, and I wasn't here for roll call, so I'd like to have my status moved from absent to tardy, please. Thank you, Simmons. This is Lo, and I'm going to piggyback off of Joel and do the same thing. Sorry I was late. Perfect. Thank you. Aquila as well. I'm going to piggyback on both of those guys. Yeah, Thank you. A lot of piggies around here. All right, we ready to move on, Misha? Yes. Member advocacy and inform member advocacy information ADA anniversary. Stephanie, it's all you. Well, hello, peeps. Um, I was just thinking about some things, and um, and it's perfectly fair if ever you say I'm thinking about, and you cut me off and say. Don't do that. Uh, <laughs> sometimes th too much thinking will get me into trouble. But I was just thinking about beyond Cody and the activities that each of you are involved in um, uh, as volunteers that, that help us move the, the equity needle for people with disabilities at the city. I thought, what kinds of things might they be interested in beyond the city? And I'll use myself as an example. I'm extremely interested in accessible and um, customer service friendly health care. You know, um, Adam mentioned the medical model and things like that. And even when I go to a fairly new facility, staff that appear to be up on, you know, all the latest and greatest and the populations that are going to come through their doors. I still get, we can't offer lifting assistance, but you can, and it's easy to do, just a matter of dialoguing with a person, okay? Um, I just wanted, I guess, to, to, because the anniversary of the ADA is coming up when it was signed into law, July 26th, I wanted us to all just kindly put our thinking caps on and think about ways how do we or how could we be more educational and more um, better advocates, if you will? And, and I just want to encourage you, I believe in educating and advocating or preparing for litigating. And I don't want to be litigated against. I don't want to go to litigation for anybody. I want to meet people where they are, understand why it is they don't appreciate the fact that I should be able to come into that facility just as easily as anybody else, you know, because they don't know. They don't know what they don't know. And if they have no lived experience with disability, I feel like I owe them just a wee bit of education. Now, if you're educated and folks have advocated and you still don't get it or listen or want to get it, that's a different story. But it just made me think about the importance of advocacy and how we're not, we're probably advocating when we don't even realize that we're advocating. You know, when you mention to somebody that, uh, you know, your table out here on this sidewalk is making it really difficult for the wheelchair, Hank smiling, 
for the wheelchair users and the people on rollators and folks pushing children in strollers. It's a dangerous thing, you know. Um, that table didn't get moved at that event that day, but the seed was planted. Okay, so that business owner now hopefully will be thinking down the road, if there's a street party or festival and I want to put my wares out, I just can't do it in front of my store, you know. Um, I have been a person with a disability since 1987. So I'm coming up on my 36th year, I think. And Lord knows I've seen and learned a lot. I have evolved a lot as a person, you know, in my ways of thinking about access and equity and things like that. So I just encourage you as July is coming up, I encourage all of us to just be mindful. Adam kind of um, discussed, you know, the, the wings that have lifted me up today are those folks that flew before me. And you do have to be mindful of your Ed Roberts, your Judy Humans, your Justin Darts, you know, because we can all make that same kind of impact. You don't have to shut down a federal building with protests. You don't have to chain your chair to the guys next to you's wheelchair and block a public bus. We can all make a difference. And it's often the little ways that we make effort that end up making a big impact. And so that's just been something that's been on my mind. And I wanted to let everybody know that. And I should also say that the Disability Resource Center will be having there an event on the 26th. So um, if you guys see in, any information about that, share it with us. And if we see it, we will share it with you all. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Appreciate you. Um, let's see. Uh, committee Sorry. reports. Oh, wait, what? Go ahead. Anybody? Sorry. Uh, no, Paul was saying thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Oh, gotcha. Uh, committee reports. Bylaws did not meet. Membership. I guess did not. Oh, wait. Oh, membership. No, it goes on down. So there's a lot to talk about membership. Who is that? Uh, I'll do that. Um, Monica is not here today with a uh, excused absence. So there are several, several resignations at the end of this fiscal year. Uh, previously reported are Logan Black and Hank Jenkins. Uh, Logan could not be here today, it seems, but Hank Jenkins is here. Um, we also have a new resignation at the end of the fiscal year to report, um, which is our chair, Dennis Landfather. And we will miss everybody immensely um, after this meeting because it, it is uh, both of your last meetings, but you are always welcome to come and visit us at any time. And we hope wherever you are and whatever you're doing, you do not lose touch with us um, as a Cody body and also with Stephanie and I in disability services. Um, we do have several recommendations for Cody membership. And those are Jackson Kane, John Eldridge, and Lauren Ziegler. Um, I will go over those here in just a moment. Uh, we also need to vote on first full terms for Cody members that are currently filling partial terms. And those members are Ashley Wells Ajinkia, Hillary Brooks, Nancy Carter, Christopher Maddie Matheson, and Paul Robertson. And then we will also need to vote on second terms for current Cody members, uh, Joel Simmons and Stacey Spangler. Let me grab my notes on our uh, nominees and I will briefly go over just a little bit about them. And then um, if we want to have somebody make a motion and second a motion, um, I do have polls created already to send out to the Cody membership uh, via the Zoom to uh, to get the tallies for those, I will ask any guests to please refrain from making a selection. We have Jackson Kane, who works at Legal Aid of East Tennessee as a staff attorney. Um, he does have at least three years experience with disability and disability services. And uh, we met with him, were, was impressed with some of the things that he said. Um, he not only has experience practicing in the legal field, but also grew up in a large family with siblings with disabilities. 
We also have John Eldridge, uh, who was recommended by Joel Simmons. And we met with him. He has 48 years of experience uh, and would represent the visual disability population. He is currently uh, retired. However, he did work from home from 1996 to 2008. And before that, he did uh, roles with technology, um, a startup, as well as a successful IPO in 1995. Last but not least is Lauren Ziegler, and she is the Pellissippi State Coordinator and Cultural Engagement and Conclusion. Uh, she would be representing neurodivergent central nervous system uh, and stroke survivors and has eight plus years of experience uh, with disability herself. Are there any um, additions that any of the membership committee members would like to make about these nominations? All right, does anyone have any questions? All same, no, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Would anybody like to make a motion of any sort? I'd like to make a motion. We just vote on all three of them and accept them. Okay, so I hear Simmons saying that he'd like to make a motion to vote to accept uh, all three of them at once. Barbara here, I'll second that. Okay. Give me just a minute and I will launch this poll. Well, I'm going to have to launch the poll in a second because I also have the first full and second terms in that same poll. Um, would anybody like to make a motion on the first full terms for Cody members filling partial terms? Ms. Landfather, can I make a motion? I believe you may, sir. All right. Well, I make that motion. So you motion to accept all uh, first full terms? Yes, correct. Mrs. Simmons, and I'll second Landfather suggest. Uh, All right. And then we will also need a motion uh, on the second terms for current Cody members, Joel Simmons and Stacey Spangler. Landfather, I make a motion to accept her uh, second terms on those two individuals. Okay. Can I get a second? This is Welch. I'll second it. Thank you, Elch. And I will launch the poll now. Hey, Misha, this is Barber. Not sure this poll is doing what you want it to do. Can't select all all of them. Can't select them all. It's only letting us select one. Okay, give me just one moment. I apologize about that. It's all right. It's technology. It's supposed to not work. Well, I think that this was my mistake. That will not be in the minutes because we all know Misha makes no mistakes. What mistake? Yeah, what <laughs> mistake? I I'd like mistake. to make a motion that if she makes another mistake, we have her hung every morning at sun up for a week. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we could second that motion, Joel. Okay. Let's see, multiple choice, multiple choice. And this last one, multiple choice. I apologize about that, everyone. I wish I could blame it on technology, but that was all me. All right, let's see if that works now. Somebody tell me if it's not. Uh, 
That worked. Can I vote for myself? Is that a thing? <laughs> if you are a Cody member, you can vote for yourself. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Yes. Okay. All right, it looks like the motions all passed and the result, results should be on screen. All right, wonderful. Congratulations, everyone. So glad to have everyone uh, that is doing their parcel terms with us uh, for their first full term and Joel and Stacy here for their second term, as well as to get these three amazing nominees on the board of Cody. I think that you all will love them just as much as we did in the membership committee. Okay, so Next order of business on the membership committee is that we we are going to have two chairs empty on Cody as of July 1st, 2023. However, because we have had a lot of new members, um, I recommend that we wait to fill those spots uh, for the next couple of months until we get everybody um, kind of into a more cohesive group and going on some of the great initiatives that we have and up to speed on everything. And that's it for membership. Okie dokie, thank you. Transportation did not meet. So we'll move into strategic plan reports, livability. This is low. I have the notes since Ms. Kanye is not here. Um, mm. Connie did ask about the email blast, which we actually voted on at the last Cody meeting. Um, and she was told that it was unanimously passed with the word number being removed. Um, so Zubac or Misha is gonna continue working on making the checklist accessible and contacting the um, Chamber of Commerce with Lauren Longmire to see about when we can do that when she gets caught up from being at the ADA symposium. So she gets a little break. Um, there's really not been much forward movement in terms of getting more of the accessibility checklist done. Um, we had discussed, cause we did have a list of when people were going to do it or be available to do it. And then we actually kind of changed that list at the last meeting. So we're working on making that match up. Um, and uh, I believe Zubac will update that um, with the indicated availability uh, coming up soon. Um, and then we also decided with uh, so many Cody members being on vacation um, in both June and July that we are going to forego the July livability meeting and just do an email exchange. Um, and then the next meeting will occur on August 3rd. That's all I got. Thank you, Ms. Lowe, appreciate it. Universal design, uh, looks like none, only Simmons, Villanueva, and Zubac attended. So after 15 minutes, they dismissed after due to lack of attendance. So no UD meeting was held. All right, Misha, vote on new Cody officers. It's all you. This is Zubac. I wanted to say uh, something about the livability meeting. I did end up contacting Lauren Longmire. Uh, she replied back to me today that the marketing team um, over at the Knoxville Chamber has said that they do have space in their June 28th uh, newsletter edition. So that will be going out very soon. Um, and we might have a lot more uh, businesses contacting us in the near future about doing the accessibility survey with that.
Okay, so I guess it's still over to me with the vote on new Cody officers. Um, I have created more polls for this. And with these, you really truly can only choose one. Um, we are gonna do these uh, spot by spot. So the first up is chair. And I will go ahead and watch this. Let's see, polls. Go back. Uh, so for chair, we have John Barber and George Childress as our nominees. Please place your votes now, and I should have 13 of them. Okay, it looks like we've got 12 votes. Let me see. Okay, well, regardless, um, it looks like only 12 members voted and one has abstained, uh, which would give John Barber 10 votes and George two votes. And the new chair of Cody as of July 1st will be John Barber. Congratulations, John. Congratulations, John. Thanks, y'all. Okay. So next up, uh, we will be going to the vice chair position. Give me one moment to edit this because I can no longer put uh, John Barber in to this poll. So save that. Um, vice chair is going to be launched in just a moment. Oh, I'm sharing, that's why. All right, so up for vice chair are George Childress, Karen Lowe, our current secretary, and Kanye Mall. All right, it looks like we have a winner and I will share the results here in just one moment. With uh, nine votes, our new vice chair is Karen Lowe. Congratulations, Karen. Okay, that brings us to secretary. And I will need to edit this to take Karen Lowe out of the running since she has been chosen as our uh, new vice chair. All right, it's not letting me delete the second choice. So the second choice will be disregard this choice. And here's your poll. <laughs> Unfortunately, we only had Karen Lowe as a nominee uh, who was willing to do secretary. So with that in mind, we will need a Cody secretary. If anybody is willing, see somebody voted for disregard this choice. Um, if anybody, some, some of us have to vote for disregard this choice. If anybody is willing to act as secretary, please let us know now. And I am pulling up, uh, I am pulling up the chat and I'm going to end the poll. This is Simmons. I'd like to 
thank Regis for coming into our meeting on her birthday. Happy birthday, young lady. Happy birthday, Regis. Thank you. We would sing, but this is being recorded and you really don't want to get exposed to that. But happy birthday. Okay, so we do have one potential secretary um, that is quite possibly interested, and I have another that is coming in. Both of you say maybe and might. Does that mean that you're both willing? And you can you can message me privately. I do not mind. Um, is this something that you are willing to undertake? Uh, on a monthly basis. It is a lot of writing. I do have transcripts so that I can share with you. If ever you do have to meet, miss a meeting, uh, we do have the video recordings that you can go back and look at to fill in some of the gaps in the transcripts. Um, but you can ask Karen, our current secretary, it can be a little bit of work and whoever does it, um, I would greatly appreciate it. I know it's uh, one, of the, one of the harder jobs on Cody. This is Ashley. Um, I'm just being that this is my first or second <laughs> Cody meeting. I guess I was uh, just kind of curious to learn more. So I don't know if I can talk with uh, Karen separately, or I, I guess I just want a little bit more information about it. If it's you know transcribing and notes and stuff like that, I feel like I can do that um, pretty easily. So okay, well. Yeah, I don't know who else was interested. I don't want to. I don't want to take it from someone who's been here longer that is interested. I don't think anybody is truly um, anxious to take on this responsibility. I think it's more of uh, people that are willing to do what's needed for the board. Um, Karen, do you want to tell them a little bit about your experience as current secretary and what you do on a on a monthly basis? Um, sure. Uh, Usually I wait till the last minute and then I sit down and watch the video and then I email Misha apologizing that it was at the last minute, um, but it is a lot of transcribing some things you can summarize because um, you don't need it word for word, um, but you want to get the gist of what everybody was saying and especially if we have uh, you know, a presenter or something, you want to make sure that that's included. It adds... Um, depending on the length of the meeting, you know, and how well you take notes during the meeting, you know, you may have to watch the whole video again, or you may just be able to skip through what you missed or what you didn't quite, you know, who said what or some that kind of thing. So for me, it hasn't been that hard. Um, it's just, you know, occasionally Saturday night trying to figure out the time to do it. Um, but it, it only adds about an hour and a half or so to the, you know, what you're already doing for Cody. So for me, it wasn't that big of a deal and Misha's very forgiving so you know and she works with you if you're like I'm not sure what was said or if I wrote that right she understands and so does Stephanie <laughs> okay with that in mind um will both people that let me know that they're interested send me a quick private message and let me know if you would like me to put you in a poll today or if you would like to uh, wait and try to pick this back up uh, in July after we have a chance to discuss it more. Stephanie, I see you. <clears throat> My only caution is all of the new Cody nominees and officers go before city council June 20 something. So today is it. Okay. And by by bylaws, we have a secretary position, and I don't think we can go with it not being filled. I'm sorry. It is okay, and I'm gonna have to duplicate this. I do have this permission. Low. I have a question co comment. If it's two new, brand new people, I don't mind being a backup person and sharing my email and helping you the first couple times if you would like that. It really isn't, you know, a big deal to me to do that. Well, I really appreciate that. Um, it looks like both people that had said that they were interested are willing to um, be put in the poll today. 
So I am going to go ahead and save this poll and then I am going to launch it. Uh, our two nominees are Ashley Wells Ajinkia and Nancy Welch. Okay, wonderful. It looks like we have a winner. I will launch uh, the results. And Nancy, as a, if you don't have enough to do with transportation, you are now our new Cody secretary. Ashley, oh, thank, thank you. you so much for, for playing along today. And congratulations to John Barber, our new chair, uh, Karen Lowe, our new vice chair, and Nancy Welch, our new secretary. Thank you. All right, sorry about that. Um, thank you, Misha, and congratulations to all the new Cody officers. Yay. And now we're in new business. Um, Misha, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with this. There's a lot of information here, so I'll just let you take it. Thank you. Um, all right, so mayoral and city council candidates forum. Um, Cody has typically held forums during each city election cycle, and we're going to need to start planning in the coming weeks in order to do so again before the primary vote on August 29th, 2023. Um, general election will be on November 7th, 2023. However, if one person gets the majority of votes uh, during the primaries, then they'll be going on to the general election. Therefore, it is in our best interest to go ahead and uh, do the forum before the primaries. Uh, the candidates for mayor are India Kincannon, who is our current mayor, Barack Ur, Constance Avery, R.C. Lawhorn, and Jeff Tallman. We also have several city council candidates. Um, we've got those for the at-large seat A, which is Lynn Fugate, uh, our current uh, seat A. Cameron, Cameron Brooks and Darren Warsham. We also have candidates for the at-large seat B, which is Debbie Helsey and uh, Bentley Marlowe. And then candidates for the at-large seat C, which are Amelia Parker, uh, current uh, person in that position, Matthew Best and Tim Hill. So questions asked in the last forum, I will go over those in just a moment. Um, however, I do wanna point out that during the last forum, uh, because of the amount of people that were interested in the seat for mayor, as well as the seat for city council positions, all we did was interview those um, at the forum that were up for mayor. And then the city council candidates, we did send the questions to, got those back via email and then posted those on our website. I am going to briefly read through these questions. Number one, describe your experience with individuals with disabilities in Knoxville. How have you included individuals with disabilities in your campaign efforts? How do you plan to include this population during your tenure as mayor? The second question we asked, I'm gonna look at it on my bigger screen. The second question we asked, the city of Knoxville has aging and outdated recreational facilities and park spaces that are included in an ADA study to identify what needs need to be done to make these areas inclusive and able to promote healthy lifestyles for people of all ages and abilities. We have received $1.4 million to date to remediate 21 facilities. While this is a good start towards making these facilities ADA compliant, 
more funding is needed to complete additional improvements. What is your plan to ensure that accessibility and ADA compliance is a necessity when it comes to providing resources and funding? The third question that we asked was, how will your leadership as mayor encourage other departments and local businesses to support greater civic participation by residents of all ages and abilities? Fourth question, for years, the city of Knoxville has supported the meaningful employment of in individuals with disabilities by participating in National Disability Employment Awareness Month activities hosting several job seekers with disabilities throughout the city, as well as regular engagement with the Knoxville Area Employment Consortium. Describe your past participation in these efforts and how you would improve them. The fifth question, Knoxville's Disability Services Office serves over 300 residents and visitors with disabilities each year and is comprised of one full-time, and one part-time employee. This office is responsible for providing information, addressing ADA complaints, guiding the city's ADA compliance efforts, and providing city employee accommodation requests. Cody has long supported the expansion of this office in order to provide additional supports and services to individuals with disabilities who live and visit Knoxville. How are you going to ensure that our city makes more headway in supporting persons with disabilities through an expansion of the Disability Services Office. Number six, <clears throat> active leadership by persons with disabilities is necessary to ensure that any decisions made are made with these voices being present to identify how those decisions may impact our community. How will you engage with disabilities to be included in key city leadership posts? Number seven, living with a disability is very expensive and the lack of accessible housing and aging compounds the problem. This can force individuals to live in institutional settings versus independent living within their communities. As mayor, how will you increase the percentage of accessible housing units required to address this systemic issue? Number eight, Transportation options are a, are a critical concern for thousands of individuals with disabilities and those aging in the Knoxville area. How will you address the lack of accessible cabs or Uber and lack of and compliance with accessible street parking, accessible sidewalks, bus stops and crosswalks, and the lack of accountability for access and emerging transit technologies? And the very last one, number nine, homelessness is a term that goes a lot deeper than what is actually seen on the surface and is greater than just mental illness and addiction. Veterans, persons with disabilities, victims of domestic violence, individuals with job loss, individuals not qualifying for services, opioid addiction, et cetera. How do you per perceive homelessness? I'm sorry. How do you perceive homelessness in Knoxville and how are you going to combat this issue during your term as mayor? So those are our nine questions. We will need to uh, discuss those at some point. I'm not sure if you all would like to start discussing them now or if you would like to table finalization of questions uh, until July once everybody has a chance to go through them, I can send them out via email and have people send suggestions of additional questions um, for us to discuss at July if anybody would like to make a motion to do so. I'll make a motion that we push it out to July. All right. May, may I suggest, let's just keep in mind, this is Stephanie, I'm sorry. Let's keep in mind that we're going to have to let all the mayoral candidates know we've got to pick a date, location, secure accommodations, etc. So I'm a little hesitating on pushing it out a month when we need to have it happen 
in, you know, mid-August. What do you think? Um, Spangler? I just had a question. Uh, this is Spangler. Uh, how are, like, are we going to a city council meeting and we're going to be asking the mayoral candidates these questions? Like, what's the forum in which we're asking them? The forum is one that Cody throws. Um, back in 2019, we put together a, a forum and invited the city council candidates um, to respond, uh, as well as the mayoral candidates to attend. And during that forum, we did have part transcription services. We invited the general public, uh, got most of the Cody members to attend, even took a picture afterwards. Um, I believe it's on the Cody Facebook page. I think I was there for that, I, but it I was before there I was too. on Cody. <laughs> I think you were there too. I think I remember seeing you in the picture. Um, and it, it was about, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, about two hours, Stephanie. Yeah, it, it was. And somewhere we have the transcripts. Yes. From each of those candidates. So that would also be available. Um, didn't we put that on the DSO website? We did. But anyone that, you know, wanted to see where the candidates landed on positions or particular issues that we made that available to them. Um, and I will say, I don't see these come questions as being in concrete. They can change. They can reduce in number, go whatever, you know. Uh, we just have to keep in mind, I think, I think there are five, yes, five um, mayoral candidates. And so we want to make sure that when we give them a question, they're hopefully, you know, we'll give it to them in advance. And then they'll take those questions, look at them, digest them probably come up, you know, with some of their responses. But then once we're in the forum, they have a limited amount of time to give those answers, like two maybe minutes. So there's quite a bit of logistic planning that goes into something like this. And we can pull it off. We've done it twice before. But um, yeah, I, I think we might want to do this just a little sooner than the July. Barbara here. I got. I've got a couple questions. Uh, where was it hosted last time? It was hosted in the large assembly room. And if there are five mayoral candidates, is there a reason why it can't just be a mayoral candidate forum? That's what I'm saying that we did last time, and that I think would be um, pertinent to do this time with as okay. many uh, city council seats as we have. I would still recommend that we ask. Uh, those candidates to answer via email and also publish those uh, just like we did last time. But not not ask them to attend. No, no, no. Okay. Cool. So next question, Barbara, again, um, can we go ahead and, I mean, I feel like this is mostly Stephanie and Misha's deal, but plan the, the details, the location, the time, and the date, and discuss the questions, the specificity on the questions in July. Perhaps, <clears throat> excuse me. I think if Misha sends these out to y'all for you to digest and everything, as long as folks come to the July meeting with final, final, don't let me think about this another week kind of thoughts, you know, on the questions that they proposed asking or changing or taking off, we may be able to do that. We may be able to do that. But I think in the meantime, we need to get a date and a location selected, uh, get our CART individual, put our interpreters on notice so that it's on everybody's radar. And then, um, you know, hopefully, prayerfully, we can get 99.9% .9 Cody member attendance because that's impact when the candidates look out at, at the audience and they see those individuals that have been appointed by the mayor to do this very thing and that they're there and they're, they're extremely interested. So yeah, I can do that, but just know if we need to have a special meeting or something, we might be reaching out to you and saying, we really need to Zoom for 30 minutes on, you know, but no. that's okay. 
as far, and I'm assuming that this is going to be like in 2019, um, other than the questions, I, I, I'm pretty sure that I did just about everything um, else on my own for that. I don't mind setting up the cart. Um, I don't mind finding a location. I don't mind doing all of that. Um, it is about a lot of back and forth with the different candidates because of different mayoral forums. Um, the intern that I've currently got um, in Disability Services Office already knows that when she comes back on, um, I believe it's on June 28th is the next day that we'll both be in the office together, that this is one of the first things that we're doing and we're going to have to first find out when any other mayoral forums are. Um, so once that's done, we will start reaching out, we will secure a date that we can do this. And then at that point, we will secure the location. Um, once that is done, we'll go ahead and schedule a cart, we'll get interpreters, um, we'll get Knoxville Community Media there. In the meantime though, I will send out this, um, this set of questions. It will not be today, I am out of hours for the week in five minutes. Um, so it will be next week before you get these, however, I would like everybody to please respond um, with either, I love these questions, I think they're great, I'm good accepting them as they are, or I think we should add this question or modify this question or take out that question. If we can get everybody's responses um, very quickly for this, we, I can even send out another email prior to the July meeting that has a rundown of every single uh, question that has been suggested that is not currently on there, every modification and all questions that were accepted as is. That sounds great, Misha. Do we have a motion in a, in a second? I move that uh, we do what Misha just said. Thank you, Barbara. I second, I second the notion to do what Misha just said. Thank you, Spangler. All right, I will make it happen. Okay, so next order of business. Um, Cody full day retreat is August 18th, 2023. We very much need to hold a full day retreat um, at some point very soon because we need to work on our new strategic plan uh, that has been pushed off for way too long. But with this forum happening by August 29th, um, how do you all feel about the full day retreat? Is this something you are willing to do in addition to the forum um, in the month of August? Would you like me to try to res reschedule the all day retreat for a later month such as September? I don't want it to be pushed out too far if you all um, feel that that's necessary. Uh, Barbara, well. go ahead. Sorry. This is Welch. I do have a question. When it going back to the forum, is that something that's in the evening? Yes. Okay. Uh, Barbara here. I am great pushing that off till September. And I, that's just, that would be on our normal meeting day, correct? Uh, we typically do it on a Friday since it is a full day retreat. Um, if everybody, I've already got a location secured. Um, I do not mind us doing both of these in one month. If everybody here is actually willing to do that um, and attend the mayoral forum, what I don't wanna have happen is everybody attend the full day retreat and then a forum a couple of days later or a couple of days before, and we don't have the Cody members show up for that. Discussion? Cook? How about? retreat in September. And then that would give a little slot on that retreat agenda to kind of debrief from the forum. Okay, I actually really like that idea and I didn't think about debriefing from that. Well, and I don't know which location you've secured, but the public, the, the new public uh, safety complex just opened this week to Joe Q citizenry. So there may be some opportunities over there. Okay. But we, have, we have good venues so we can choose from. 
And um, I just got a message and I'll, I'll go ahead and announce it. Um, but Barbara will be out of uh, the country from the 22nd through the 29th of September. So we will not be doing it um, during those dates. We can't do it without our brand new fearless chair. This is Welch. Um, I just kind of thinking if you move what we had scheduled for August, could you use the whatever location that is for the forum? No, it was at um, Public Works Complex, um, the little room that we've met in before when you first walk in over to the right. If we're going to do a forum, we are going to need uh, to have uh, not only enough seating for it, um, every candidate needs a microphone. We're going to need um, a screen behind us so that people that need to read um, the CART transcription can do so. So it's going to be much better. I'm going to say not even in the small assembly room. I would prefer doing it in the large assembly room to give that enough space uh, for what I feel like we're going to need. Okay. Okay. So um, does somebody want to make a motion to push a retreat to September? I'll make a motion. This is Fangler. I'll make a motion to push the retreat to September. Okay, thank you. This is Welch, I'll second it. Thank you. All right. Now, um, because we had done the full day retreat in lieu of the regular August Cody meeting, would anybody like to make a motion uh, that we hold a regular August Cody meeting? Or another motion. I'll make, this is Spangler, I'll make a motion that we just have a regular Cody meeting in August. Okay. Do I have a second? This is Welch, I'll second it. Thank you. I will um, make that happen. I will change the website to reflect that as well. Okay. Um, I wanted to make just a general announcement that Cody Grants Committee will be meeting on Wednesday, June 21st at one o'clock p.m. via Zoom. Um, if anybody that is not on that ad hoc committee would like to attend, please feel free to do so. Uh, send me an email and I will get the information out to you. Or you can use the same information you did to join this meeting today to join us um, on the 21st at 1. Thank you, Misha. Oh, go, go ahead. I, I just wanted to say before Dennis and, and Hank, um, you know, drop off here, I, I wanted to let you guys know we so appreciate your all's joining us, the work, the effort, the interest that you have put in while you've been here. You're always welcome. You do know we meet mostly on Zoom. And you kind of know when we do that. So wherever you are, what you're doing, if you can join us, please do. Um, and I just want to thank you personally for your service to the city. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, that's perfect timing because we move into announcements and public forum. Uh, so the one announcement, it looks like potential public forum speaker, Donna Taylor. Misha, you want to just brief on that real quick or? Well, she is not attending today. And because of that, I don't want to um, tell her personal business. She may end up attending at a future meeting. And if so, she is more than welcome to. Great. Thank you. Um, so we are getting close to wrapping up here. And I just want to say thank I, you I have for uh, who's that? I can't find the hand raised. Oh, go ahead, Regis. Yeah, I did want to announce that the um, mountain biking, the adaptive mountain biking is now permanently going to be held at Baker's Creek. And it's the third Saturday of each month. And we are also doing uh, the adaptive kayaking the following weekend. Thank you, Regis. Um, so I just want to say thank you to all of you for allowing me uh, to be on this 
body for the last two years. It has been an eye-opening experience. It has been an amazing experience. Um, and this was a long decision for me on whether or not I was going to do this. As Misha and Stephanie both know, uh, I just need to kind of regroup in my personal life right now. So I need to take some time back. Um, and again, thank you so much for the last two years. I, it's been like it has. Anybody else have anything for announcements in public forum? Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Hank. You guys are awesome. I appreciate you very much. It's been great getting to know you and I really value your, your service uh, to this body. Thank you. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Well, unless there's anything else, I guess this will be my last time doing this. Um, so we will adjourn this meeting at 4.35 p.m. I'm missing my gavel. Dang it. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Thank you.